Hello, and welcome to Essential BibFrame, a simple introduction to a new standard for encoding bibliographic metadata. My name is Amber Billy, and I am the Metadata Librarian at Columbia University Libraries. It's my pleasure to introduce this new and evolving library cataloging standard to you today. Before we get started with BibFrame, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I have over 10 years of digitization and cataloging experience for cultural heritage institutions. I received my master's in library science from Pratt Institute in 2009, where I later taught courses in knowledge organization and metadata. Last year, I was part of a cohort of academic librarians who completed BibFrame training by Zafira, the data consultants that worked with Library of Congress to develop BibFrame. And finally, I like to say that I'm curious by nature. I think we are in a fascinating era for libraries, full of possibilities. And I hope that my enthusiasm will inspire you to be curious about these new and exciting developments in library data management. Before we can really talk about what BibFrame is, we have to know why a new standard is even needed in the first place. We need to look under the hood, so to speak and understand why the library community needs a new way to encode and share bibliographic information about our collections. Libraries have always maintained structured information about their collections. We worked very hard to make sure that people could find the information that they needed through providing access to important information like titles, authors, and subjects. At first, we recorded these in book catalogs, then card catalogs, Card catalogs provided a unique experience where the researcher could navigate relationships between information provided in the cards. To improve the efficiency of catalog card production, in the late 1960s, Henrietta Avram at the Library of Congress developed a way to encode bibliographic information so that the data was machine readable and could be used to automate printing catalog cards. Throughout the last half of the 20th century and into the 21st century, libraries rushed into automation based on the stable foundation of MARC catalog records. Libraries worldwide rely on MARC-based systems for the communication, storage, and expression of their bibliographic data. But there's a problem with MARC metadata. MARC can make great catalog cards. MARC is so structured, it makes terrific, reliable, and stable data. But it cannot integrate or engage with the World Wide Web. While libraries were investing time, energy, and money into systems built entirely on MARC, the open web was born and completely changed how we express and share information. While the early open internet was a web of documents, we are moving into an era of data on the web. By leveraging common internet standards, we are able to use the web to share, reference, and store data. This idea is known as linked data, and it's everywhere on the web. Linked data is now an essential part of the internet. Search engines utilize linked data to display useful metadata like biographical information from sources who publish their data as open linked data, such as Wikipedia. Imagine if local library holdings displayed in search engine results. Linked data is all about building and encoding relationships between things so that computers can make sense of the data and its relationships. Let's use some simple bibliographic information as an example to explore linked data concepts. Here we see that Paul Lay created the Traité de Documentation and S.R. Ranganathan created the Five Laws of Library Science. Each of these works is about library science. As librarians, we are familiar with this structure. We are used to adding name and subject authorities in our records. But linked data takes it a step further by encoding those relationships through stable hyperlinks, known as Uniform Resource Identifiers, or URIs. Linked data can go even further by linking additional contextual information. The possibilities for potential relationships are practically endless. In the example we see here, nearly every element could be described with a URI 
and therefore we can leverage linked data technology to encode the relationships and utilize open linked metadata from external sources available on the web. The idea of recording the relationships between bibliographic entities to organize resources and promote discovery is at the core of our cataloging work. Charles Amy Cutter knew this when he outlined his rules for a dictionary catalog in 1867, and we're still striving for this today. With linked data, we're able to take this to the next level by leveraging linked data technologies in our catalogs. It will enrich resource descriptions, expose our metadata to the open web, and further enable library users to unlock our often hidden collections by exposing their relationships in meaningful ways. This is where BibFrame enters the picture. So now that we have an understanding of why BibFrame was developed, let's take a look at what BibFrame actually is. BibFrame is essentially a framework or linked data vocabulary for structuring and expressing bibliographic metadata and the relationships between bibliographic entities. BibFrame was developed primarily to replace MARC. It utilizes linked data technologies to express and expose relationships between bibliographic entities within a library environment and beyond. As linked data, library metadata can integrate and engage with the wider information community. In a recent blog post by information theorist Karen Coyle, she described library linked data returning to the core of Cutter's principles for a library catalog. We move away from our OPAC inventories of titles and lists of access points and return to organization through relationships. Linked data will rebuild and enrich the nuanced relationships that we lost when we automated. It will enable contextual collocation and facilitate true discovery. <laughs> At least that's what we hope it will do. BibFrame is still very much in development. BibFrame is broken into four main classes works, instances, authorities, and annotations. It has 53 official classes with 289 properties. Classes are the objects and subjects that you want to record the relationships between, while properties are the descriptive elements about classes and the kinds of relationships there are between the classes. On the right side of the slide is a diagram of the BibFrame entity relationship model between the four classes. Conceptual works have creators and subjects and are physically represented by instances. Instances will have publishers, publication information, and format information. This is a very broad model, but it gets at the essence of the kind of relationships BibFrame hopes to bring to light. Here is an image of the 53 classes. These are familiar concepts for the kinds of entities we describe when we catalog a resource, such as monograph, person, classification, and title. And here is a screenshot sampling of the 289 properties. You can see that they are the more descriptive elements that we use when creating a record for a bibliographic entity, such as addition, authorized access point, classification scheme, title variation. This is an example of what a BibFrame record looks like when viewed in a beta BibFrame catalog. This software is freely available and open source. You can find a link to the source code from the Library of Congress BibFrame website. Also here you can see the record is serialized in various linked data formats, such as MARC XML, RDF XML, N3, and JSON LD, which can easily be downloaded. This example was created using the BibFrame transformation tool. You can explore this tool on the Library of Congress website or download the software for a local instance. You can explore other BibFrame implementations through the implementation register, which is also found on the Library of Congress website. So when will BibFrame totally replace MARC? Not yet, and not really even soon. BibFrame is still very much in development. I often hear the analogy that everyone is eager to drive the BibFrame car, but honestly, we're still building the engine. However, you can test BibFrame through the Library of Congress BibFrame site and at BibFrame.org. There you will find the current vocabulary, tools, documentation, resources, and the implementation register. You can also explore BibFrame Lite, which is a subset of the larger BibFrame vocabulary on the BibFrame Lite website. 
So what's next for BibFrame? Implementers will continue testing and exploring use cases and cataloging capabilities with various other standards and formats. They are also developing tools for creating, storing, and delivering BibFrame data, as well as evaluating how established MARC-based workflows will be affected or changed as a result of BibFrame implementation. The best way to stay up to date on BibFrame developments is through the Library of Congress BibFrame website. So that was an essential introduction to BibFrame. I hope that you gained a better understanding of what BibFrame is and why it's important that we publish library metadata as linked data. Feel free to email me if you have any follow-up questions. Thank you for this opportunity. Ciao!